Okay, everyone, let's get started. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's in good shape on lab three. Was there any major issues? As far as I could tell, it seemed to go well. We were running into a problem that was torturing us and that we were having trouble um, with testing, with like being able to see the state of the registers. You're like, hey, what's what's happening? I feel like we built a black box. Yeah. We spent a lot of time making sure everything's perfect and then it's like, okay, how do we test this? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so just in case you didn't hear that, so the question is, how do you test the CPU? Um, so I mentioned that uh, normally when I just, when I'm doing testing, I run a program, like the test program that I gave you, and I just check the state of the registers in the waveform viewer, right? But if you want to, if you want to do a, if you want to do a self-checking test bench, so you want an external test bench to be able to check the results, the only way to do it with the, the pinout of the CPU that we provided to you is to have a program that, that tests some instructions and then uses the CSRW instruction to output the result of that instruction sequence to the output port, right, and then check it from there. Um, if you're testing your CPU. If you're testing top, uh, which is, well actually SimTop does test top, right, it goes around top, then that's even more tricky because then you have to not only, you have to also consider the um, seven segment decoders as well. So you would have to take the expected value that's in a register that you're CSRRWing and then, um, you know, encode it, or decode it, I should say, into seven segment. Maybe the question's too specific, but I felt like we modified our reg register file to kind of, um, to dump the state of the registers, and then we have that connect to the CPU, and which added an output to the CPU to say, hey, dump the registers. Mm -hmm. We got it all the way up to SimTop, and I double checked those connections, but it would always output don't cares. Even if I just like read register zero yeah. from that, it would just say don't care, and I'm like, I know that's not true. Yeah, yeah, I saw I saw some some other groups that tried that. So if you take the, you know, the memory, right, the, yeah. the RAM, okay. If you take the RAM that's in your register file, the memory, I think we called it mem, yeah. or RAM, or regs, or whatever. Mem. If you take that mem and you at make it a port, that port would end up being a RAM port. It's a 2D port. And as far as I know, you can't output a RAM as a port. As far as I know. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Let me put it that way. So another, uh, another way you could do that is you could bring out, you could take the write address, write data, and reg write bits, and you can export those as ports out of your CPU and then subsequently out of top. Mm -hmm. And then you could just, you, your test bench could check that. Your test bench could be like, okay, I expect in cycle three that register five is gonna get the value 10. Mm -hmm. Now, you, the problem with that is you'd have to check it in specific cycles or you could write the test bench to just wait for something, like wait for reg write. Mm. Ooh, okay. Right, you could do that it that way. As a way to, as a way to check registers. Right. It's a good, uh, Wait on the event, right? Event so okay. I don't know if I showed, oh, I wish I had a marker. Is there any chalk? No. <clears throat> um, so here, I'll just type it in here. Uh, so you can do, I showed a few groups this, but if you have an initial, Right, and you're setting values. Well, in the case of your CPU, you're not setting any values because you just load a program, right? You can put um, at uh, reg write, and then you can say if uh, write address equals uh, five and write data equals 32D17, Actually, you want to say if um, you want to say not equal, not equal, and make that an or. Um, then you can d display error. So w what this will do is this syntax looks like a sensitivity list for an always block, but you can also use it inside an always block or inside an initial. And um, so this will wait for reg write state to change, 
So it'll hold there, and then after reg write changes, it'll it'll proceed, right? So that that's an option too. It's just another. Don't, don't initial block only run once. Though. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but you only want it to run once. Test benches usually run run once. Do, oh, okay. I see. I see. Um, okay. Makes sense. It's a, it's it's a, it's a, and then you can also do if you want to wait for like the third right, you can also do something like this. You could say repeat too, and it'll wait for that to happen. It'll wait for that to change twice before it'll move forward. Um, now that's all just test bench code. You can't obviously can't synthesize any of that. That that will disqualify it from pu putting that at symbol inside an initial or always will disqualify the code from being synthesized. Just like if you try to slap displays where they're not supposed to be. Oh, does that work too? I, does that, does this? You can't synthesize a display, so if you put it like a low-level component, it complains. Sometimes. I thought it still would synthesize; it would just ignore sometimes it. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I don't know. Uh, I haven't played around with that too much. You, you could be right. I don't know there are a lot of them. <clears throat> okay, so let's go over exam one. Uh, the grades looked looks looked good. So um, every for the most part, I mean, I thought the distribution looked good. Um, so I'll just quickly run through this. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, the first question was, assume that the following Verilog module, how many bits comprise the inputs to module AAA? Uh, this one was a little tricky because there's two inputs and they're two bits each, so it's two times two, it would be four. This one is, to what value will the following system Verilog code set to signal B when A is binary 1001? This is a, just a bit manipulation uh, question, so we're going to take bit zero of A, which is the rightmost bit, 1, and we're going to concatenate that with bit 1, which is 0, right? So, so that's bit 0, bit 1, so it's going to be 1, 0, and then two copies of bit 3, which is 1. So 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, consider the risk 5 microarchitecture shown below and assume the following instructions are in the corresponding pipeline stage is shown, which statement is true. So in fetch, we've got a mol h, decode and execute, we've got an lui, and in write back, we've got an xori. And so the first option is reg select ex is set to 1, or actually 2 bits with 1, so 0, 1. Uh, so that so to, so to know if that's right, you have to match that up with the instruction that's in the execute uh, because it's reg cell execute, right? Um, and the instruction that's in execute there is LUI. And for an LUI instruction, the reg select is supposed to uh, bring in the reg select controls this mux. And the output of that mux goes back to the register file, so that controls what you're writing, your write data. So reg select is supposed to be a one for an LUI because this wire here is the is the upper immediate, which is you know bits 31 down to 12. So in this case, that one is correct. Option one is correct. Uh, that would make op option two incorrect because if reg select ex is 2 that would bring in this bottom input which is the ALU output so reg select 2 would be for like a regular ALU ALU instruction so in Verilog when you write uh, numbers with a specified number of bits you don't have to put the leading bits that's right okay. or you can it's it's, it's optional uh, reg select ex is set to zero. That's for the GPIO in. So that's not. That would be true if we had a, um, a CSR or W in, in execute. Uh, and then reg write is set to zero. Reg write ex is set to zero rather, and that's not true because the LUI does write a register, so it would be setting the reg write to one. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, question four, which of the following statements is true? Multiple always blocks can read the same input signal. That's true. Um, System Verilog prevents the designer from mixing structural HDL and behavioral HDL in the same module. That's false. 
System Verilog module can be in instanced in an always block. False, as far as I know. Um, four, non-blocking assignment statements can be used in an assign statement. Uh, that is false. An assign statement doesn't have any notion of blocking versus non-blocking. Uh, if statements can be used outside of an always block, false. Always blocks cannot be used to design combinational logic, false. Always blocks can be used to design sequential or combinational logic. Okay, okay question five. Suppose you want to design a system Verilog module which accepted four input values of eight bits each and produced as output a single eight-bit signal uh, being a copy of one of the four input signals selected by an n-bit n input. In other words, it's a four-to-one mux. What's the minim minimum value of n? So this would be n is the, is, is the um, select in this case, or n is the width of the select. So this is a four to one mux, so you need log base two of four bits for the select, so it would be two bits. And consider the following module. How many cycles of delay exist between signal A and signal B? So signal, let's see, signal A, gets put into delay one after one cycle, delay one gets put into delay two after two cycles, but delay two gets put into B immediately without any delay. So what will happen is, is that B, A, what will happen here is A delay two uh, will update on the clock and B will update with it because it's combinational. So the answer is two, two cycles of delay. The, always, the assign doesn't add another cycle, but the two assignments inside the always FF add a cycle of delay each. So that this is basically a, uh, these are like two registers connected in series. And, and by the way, the order, the order of the two lines of code inside the always don't matter because these are non-blocking assignments. Right, which risk five instruction will multiply the value stored in register X4 by eight? That would be shift left logical I 443. So multiplying, if you shift by three, you're multiplying by two to the third power or eight. So it's the first option. Uh, now this one is a little tricky because if this were MIPS, the answer would be two. But because it's risk five, the answer is one. So this is the difference between MIPS and RISC V. Um, in MIPS, the, the, the SLL had, w was the immediate form, whereas in RISC V, you have to use SLLI to, to provide an immediate shift amount. The so, uh, following system of Verilog code will generate a repeating sequence of n values in, in consecutive cycles. What is the value of n? Uh, this one is, is actually pretty easy because all this is doing is reversing the order of, of the bits in state. Not reversing, re rearranging, actually. So zero, so it's putting the, it's putting bit zero, then bit two, then bit one, right? So um, after it does this, I believe it's three times, uh, you'll be back to where you started from. Is that right? That makes sense? <laughs> Let's figure it out. Let's make sure. <laughs> make sure I got that right. Yeah, basically it's a rotator. Yeah, so you start out with 0, 0, 1, and then you're going to go to um, 1, 0, 0. Right? Okay, then you're going to go 0, 1, 0, and then you're going to go to 0, 0, 1. I'm glad it was three, not four. So it's three, yeah. So the, the, obviously the, you know, the, the last one here is starting a new sequence, right? So it's, the answer is three, one, two, three, and then we start the next pattern that, that repeats it again, repeats the sequence again. Okay? 
Good. I was doubting myself there for a second. <laughs> I think we're okay. Question. Question nine. Assume the CPU design below has a bug where the wire labeled ALU source EX could only be driven at the value of one. That would mean that basically all you could do is I type instructions. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. That's not exactly true. That would mean that. That would mean that any ALU instruction that you issued would act like an I type version, right? Now you can bypass the ALU. Like for example, a CSRRW instruction or a load upper immediate instruction would work fine, even if this were true. But if you were doing an ALU instruction, like an add or an and, then the, the side effect would be that um, you, you could only take in the immediate as the second operand, right? So the first instruction would be fine. Add I would still work. Mall H would not work. SLLI would work. And as I mentioned, CSRRW would work because we don't care about the ALU. And same with LUI. So the only instruction that would no longer work is the mall H because the mall H requires that both inputs on the ALU be register values. Okay, which of the following is a problem with the module below? Oh, I forgot to take the backslashes out of this. Sorry, I have to, when I put these questions into Moodle, I have to escape certain characters like colon. Okay. Um, what's, the what's the problem with the module? Um, let's see. The assigned statements have four bits on the left hand side and three bits on the right hand side. Yeah, because A and B are three bits and C is four bits. So yeah, that's that's a problem. That's won't it just truncate give you a warning though? Possibly. But it's still a problem. You don't want to do that. Like you, you have to be you, you, you have to be careful when you you have to be more careful, I think, when you design HDL than regular software. Yes. Assign statement which is an equals, and then there's the other assigned statement which has the keyword assigned. Yeah, that's that's I, a continual continuous. Continuous, yeah. Continuous. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Uh, no, I meant assigned statements in the generic sense there, the uh, assignments. I should have said assignments, not assigned statements. You're right. Blocking assignments are improperly used in an always block. That's actually not, we know that's not a problem because. You know, the, te the book says that you should use blocking assignments in combinational logic. C is double driven, which is definitely not true because in order for it to be double driven, it would have to be set in another always or in another assign or in another module, right? So, or by another, you know, when I say other module, I mean by another structural expression. Um, and there's no structural HDL, which is, which is, um, which is not a requirement. You don't have to have structural HDL in every module. So, I, I agree with I agree with that. Um, it is it is misleading, but the other three, I think, are pretty obviously not not problems. The other three options, two, options two, three, and four, are, are 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 pretty obvious. One is is a bit vague, but it's really the only possibility. What? Well, the assigned statements have four bits on the left and three bits on the right. I mean that. You would eliminate that because there are no assigned statements, and you eliminate the other three because. Well, but you're saying you'd eliminate it because there's no assigned statements in there. But why would I? Why would I refer to something that doesn't exist, though? Well, I mean, because right. We're trying to find. We're trying to eliminate answers. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could see that. I mean, you'd have to. It would be pretty. I mean, it would be cr pretty crazy though to, to to specifically refer to something that wasn't there. I mean, I I meant the assignments, but yeah, I, I can see I can see I, I see your point. It is it's it's little. I should have said the assignment, the assigns or the assignments, the variable assignments or the signal assignments as, as opposed to the assigned statements. Yeah, uh, I can. Then I, I can, 
I can invalidate this one then, that's not a big deal. That's, that's fair. So for a reminder. Remind us the difference between the continual assignments and the blocking ones. I know you use them in different contexts. I just, oh, um, I'm trying to remember. Them. I'm still trying to write barrel on you. Know. So the assign, if you have an assign statement outside of an always block, it's, a, it's as you said, it's a continuous assignment statement, and it's only used in combinational logic. And it's, it's treated like a non-blocking ah, okay. assignment. And if you, were to compare it, if you were to compare it to assigning inside an always block, right? A blocking assignment is a special type of assignment that you can only do in an always block. And it has several implications, one of which is that it honors data dependencies inside of, inside of the always block, but it also honors dependencies across always blocks, which is where things get really confusing. Um, so you have to be, you have to be careful uh, with these uh, um, blocking assignments. You just want to avoid putting that in your code as much as possible. It, yeah, exactly. Although the book says if you're, using co if you're designing combinational logic, you should use them. But I, I don't know what the reason for that recommendation is. Um, so anyway, yeah, that, that, so the blocking assignment is a single equal sign. Mm -hmm. Non-blocking is less than equal sign, but if you use an assigned statement, a continuous assignment statement, then there's just one equal sign used, which is also con confusing. <laughs> the fact that there's basically three different ways to assign. Okay, uh, qu uh, question 11. Consider the risk microarchitecture shown below. What is the value of reg write uh, WB, RD WB, reg cell WB? Um, so RDWB is the register destination. I think this signal, by the way, this name RDWB, I put this in, I think, just for the exam. This, wasn't, this name didn't appear in the lecture. I don't think I named it in the lecture. I just leave it. I mean, you guys probably all gave it your own name. But I gave it a name to RDWB, which, which signifies the input into the reg file. Uh, so the problem here is that that's a five-bit signal, RD, right? So you're taking a reg write, which is one bit, RD, which is five bits, and reg cell, which is two bits. So in total, you've got eight bits there when you concatenate them with the curly brace there, right? So we're looking for an eight-bit value here as the answer. So for this guy, our reg write WB is referring to the XORI instruction, which is in the WB stage. So that should be a one, because XORI does write the register file. RDWB is going to be the the destination register for the XORI, which is three. So that's going to be one, and then three is going to be zero, 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 one, one. Okay, so one, zero, 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 one, one. And then reg select WB is going to be two, which is one, zero. Did I put the answer in there? No, I didn't. So it's going to be one, underscore, underscores, remember, underscores are ignored. They're just used to separate bit fields. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, this 3, underscore 1, 0, right? Okay. And then the other multiple choice answers are hex to support the rest. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, did I mix them? I think I mixed them, yeah. didn't I? Yeah. Which of the following system Verilog statements takes as input an unsigned 8-bit value and multiplies it by 3? This is similar to the other question I asked where I was using RISC, RISC 5 instruction. Uh, but I'm multiplying by 3, so you might say, well, wait a second, I thought you can only multiply by powers of 2 by shifting, and 3 is not a power of 2. Um, yes, so in order to multiply by a non-power of 2, you have to shift and add. You have, to, you have to shift the multiplicand by the amount for each one bit in the multiplier. So if you're multiplying by three, you basically shift by one bit to the left, which multiplies it by two, and then you add a copy of the original value A. So you take A and multiply it to the left, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. You take A and you shift it to the left by one bit, and then you add a to the result of that. So in Verilog, 
uh, you can use the curly braces here to shift a by one bit using a comma one b zero. So this this will take a and concatenate it with a zero, right? It's like if you know base ten. If you want to multiply by ten, you add a zero, right? So in this case, you add a zero in bit binary. You're multiplying by two, and then you add a. But but you can't just add a because you'll be adding two different bit widths now because you've added a you've added one bit uh, to the first operand of the add, right? So I didn't even tell you how many bits A is here, but let, let's say A is 8 bits, right? So this expression will be 9 bits, and so you want to add 9 bits, so you're going to zero pad A by adding a, a zero to the right-hand side. So if you add a zero to the left-hand side, you're shifting it by 2, I'm sorry, you're shifting it by 1, or multiplying it by 2, but if you add a zero to the right-hand side, you're not doing anything aside from changing the sign if it was a sign number, but this is, these are meant to be unsigned. So, um, yeah, I said unsigned there too in the question. Um, so the answer is one. Which of the following system verilog statements will receive three one-bit inputs, A, B, and C, and produce a one-bit output Y that is true if an even number of its inputs are true? So the the, if you XOR A, B, and C, that will be true if an odd number of inputs are true, right? Because an XOR is like a mod, modulo 2 operation. Um, a plus B plus C um, you're adding there. That's a little confusing though because I don't know what the size of Y is and I don't think that would work. No, that definitely wouldn't work, because even if y was one bit, um, that wouldn't work. Because that would be said if there was at least one, or if there was, actually no, it would be said if there was a, it would, it would do the same thing as option one, actually, right? It would be like uh, an XOR. Um, three is an OR, that wouldn't work. That would be true if at least one was true. Um, option four is, basically the same as option one, is equivalent. And then option five is, says if a plus b plus c equals two apostrophe, d, or two um, apostrophe d zero, which is um, basically adding a, b, and c, which are one bits, one bit each, but then uh, evaluating it as a two bit um, sum. And so if you add them up and, you know, the answer is zero, or if the answer is two, then an even number of, of the inputs are true. You guys with me? I think that's the only option, right? Zero or two, right? Okay. Uh, assume the following Verilog module. Um, fill in the missing values from top to bottom for the test vectors. So this is basically just a truth table for an AND, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just AND, so it would be um, these are in order, right? Yeah. So zero, 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 one. I like this question. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is like a two eleven question. When a when a program is being executed on a three stage risk five CPU, what stage is the third instruction? When the second instruction is in W B, I would be in um, execute, right? Because the second instruction would be ahead of the third instruction in the pipeline, because the second instruction came earlier and was executed earlier. So, it's just execute. This is just a, you know. That's not what you said, though. The answer is decode execute. Yeah. Oh, decode, I'm sorry, decode execute, yeah. Yes, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, that one's, well, yeah, because it's the three, yeah, the three stage risk five CPU combines decode and execute. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one's also not very good, because <laughs> I sometimes refer to the second stage as execute, and sometimes I say decode execute. Yeah, I'll, I'll take either. I'll, for that one, I'll take either. <laughs> I think either, either one's right. Either one's correct. If you said decode or decode execute. Okay. Okay. Uh, any, any other questions? Okay. So hopefully I can finish up the microarchitecture lecture today. And in lab this week, we'll assign lab four, which is the, the last lab.
so these Okay, so I talked about that. Okay, so Risk Five uh, has, like MIPS, it has branch and jump instructions. The difference is is that jumps are unconditional, branches are conditional. That's not always true for every architecture, though. That's specific to Risk and uh, Risk architectures like ARM and. I think ARM uses the same terminology, right? Um, so both instructions are change of control flow instructions, so they interrupt the normal sequential execution of instructions. Basically, they, they change the program counter to be something other than PC plus one. Okay, so the question, the, the other difference between branch and jumps, though, is the way that the target is specified in the instruction. They use different addressing mechanisms. Now you might say, why? Why do they do that? Why would you use, why not just use the same, why not use the same addressing? In fact, there's a reason why you'd want to use the same addressing because it simplifies the hardware. Right? The hardware would be simpler if you just had one way to specify a target address to jump or branch to, right? The reason is, is because branch instructions have to have registers in them. So they have less bits to specify the target, whereas jumps, because they're unconditional, are able to allocate more bits for the target, which gives jump instructions greater range in general. Jump instructions typically can go farther in terms of the difference between the current PC and the target PC. They can go farther, they can jump farther away than a branch can because branches are limited to their 12-bit immediate. And in RISC, it's really bad because remember in MIPS, the immediate field was 16 bits. So that allowed a, a branch instruction to go backwards 32,000 instructions or forward 32,000 instructions, right? Whereas with RISC, as a 12-bit immediate, so you can only go backwards 2,000 instructions or forward 2,000 instructions. So that's it's pretty bad. Uh, so if you have to go farther than 2,000 instructions, which is hardly anything, then you're going to need, um, and, and you need conditional behavior, then you'd have to combine a branch and a jump together somehow. You use the branch for the conditional part and the jump for the range, right? So that's the reason why they don't use the same addressing. But there's one other difference um, even with respect to branches. Now hopefully you guys remember that branches use PC relative addressing. So basically they take the immediate and they use that as the delta that you add to the, the current program counter value to specify the target. So basically what that means is, is the immediate is how many instructions to skip. And it's a signed number. So when you say how many to skip, you can say skip the next five instructions if this branch is taken, or you can say skip backwards five instruction if this branch is taken, right? It's essentially how it works. It's just an offset forward or back. And the offset is expressed as a word address, not a byte address, which in our case it doesn't matter because everything we do in this class is word addressed, right? But if this were a regular processor, you would have to take that offset value, and the immediate value, and multiply it by four but we don't have to worry about that in this class because everything we do is, is word addressed and instructions are words. Does it make sense, right? So that, that's another thing that we can simplify. However, the question is, is you guys probably thought, you know, you might be thinking, wait a minute, hold on. In our pipeline CPU, we have PC fetch. That's our PC value, it's called PC fetch. And PC fetch is the address of the instruction that's in the fetch stage. But the instruction being executed is actually one instruction before the PC fetch, right? Because of the pipeline, right? This is, you know, like, it's, it's kind of like the exam question where the instruction being executed actually comes before the instruction that's being fetched. And the only program counter we currently have is PC fetch, right? So in other words, PC fetch is the address of the instruction after the branch, right? Now you might remember from MIPS, MIPS just assumes that 
in general. Like if, so in other words, if you're writing MIPS code and your offset is zero, and you take the branch, where do you go? You just go to the next instruction after the branch. It has no effect at all, right? In other words, if, if your branch offset were zero in MIPS, it wouldn't matter if you take the branch or not take the branch because either way you're going to go to the next instruction, right? Likewise, if your PC was negative, if your offset was negative one and you took the branch, then you're, you're dead because it'll just, that's, that's a one instruction infinite loop that will be impossible to get out of, okay? However, for some reason, in RISC-V, they decided to change that. So in RISC-V, the, the branch offset is relative to the address of the branch instruction. So they changed it up. Now in RISC-V, if your offset is zero, that's your infinite loop. If your offset is negative one, you jump back one instruction. Okay, so it's a kind of a subtle change, but I'm showing a screenshot here from both RARS and MARS to illustrate this. So this first one here is RARS, and the second one is MARS. And both instructions say foo branch of equal t1, t2 to foo. So basically it's a branch to itself, right? So I gave, I gave both simulators the same instruction. The only difference is MIPS requires the dollar sign in front of the registers. Aside from that, same thing. But if you look at the immediate, the immediate field, and actually if you look at the if you look at this column, this is the, um, this actually shows the offset without having to look at the binary or the actual machine code. Check this out. In RARS, this guy has an offset of zero because branching to yourself means offset of zero. Whereas in MARS, it's negative one. Meaning branching yourself means offset negative one. So what does that mean for us? What it means for you is you guys are going to have to create another program counter called PCEX, which is the program counter from the previous cycle that corresponds to the address of the instruction that's in the execute stage, right? Now, how do you do that? Easy. Just say always, always underscore FF at pause edge clock PCEX equals PC fetch. And that's all you got to do. It'll just, but you'll have two program counters. You'll have one that's the next instruction and one that's the current instruction, right? So when you pr calculate your branch target, um, it'll be, you know, using, in, in case of risk 5 PCEX. Okay, so we have, we're going to put in six branch instructions. Now, the other difference with MIPS is that MIPS had... MIPS had a branch if equal zero and branch if not equal zero, I believe. Those might have been pseudo instructions, but uh, but but in any case, Risk Five doesn't have those as real instructions. In in Risk Five, all the branches compare two registers, not one register and zero. That's not an option. Of course, you can always use register zero as your second register if you want to do that. Okay. Um, now, the one other weird thing about, about RISC-V, there's another difference too. I forgot about this until till the slide reminded me. Um, the immediate value in MIPS, I mentioned, was a, byte ad it was a word address. And so if you were in a byte address system, you had to multiply it by four, right? Because you might say, well, what, why? Because Every instruction is going to be divisible. Every instruction address is going to be equally divisible. Uh, is going to be divisible by four, right? It's going to be aligned on the four-byte boundary because every instruction is 32 bits, right? So, so if you were putting a byte address into your instruction, you'd waste two bits because the last two bits would always be zero zero, right? So MIP said, "Yeah, it's fine. Just delete the last two bits," and so. We'll just make the offset relative to the number of instructions I want to skip forward or backwards, right? But if you're going to do a byte address, you have to multiply it by four because every instruction is four bytes, right? In risk five, they don't do that. The offset is the byte address divided by two. So the offset in risk 5 is in units of 16 bits, which means that 
in your code, you're going to actually have to divide the offset by two to make it a word address as opposed to a something that addresses 16 bits. Now, why would they do that? Why do they do that in risk 5 What is the point of that? Because that would mean that every offset is going to have a zero at the end, right? Well, the reason they do that is because risk 5 has a 16-bit mode. ARM has that too, by the way. ARM processors, like the ones that are in your phone, they have a mode called thumb mode that uses 16-bit instruction encoding. RISC has the same thing because they, they kind of copied that from ARM. That's something that MIPS didn't have, by the way. MIPS had no 16-bit mode. RISC and ARM have 16-bit modes. So as a result, the instructions can actually be 16-bit offsets. Not, not, not in this class, but if you supported the, 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 the compact instruction format. So they just basically said, well, we're just going to say all the offsets are 16-bit in units of 16 bits. So all of that just to say divide the offset by 2, shift it by 1 bit to the right before you calculate your branch target. Okay? Okay, so the encoding is a little strange, <laughs> too. In, uh, I don't know why they do this, but um, the bits that are used to calculate the offset are kind of spread around the instruction. They're not in one spot like they are in MIPS. So the branch instructions use an I-type format. So there's a 12-bit immediate on the left side of the instruction. But it represents it represents um, bit 12 and bits 10 down to 5 and then part of the immediate is over here on the right hand side of the instruction <laughs> where the func function 7 normally is I think or or where the destination register normally is. Sorry, yeah, sorry. That's where the destination usually goes, right? So there's a 5-bit field there. Actually, a 6-bit, no, 5-bit field. Yeah, 4 down to 1 and 11. There's a 5-bit field for the destination register, which branches don't need a destination register, right? You just have two inputs registers. So th they use the destination field for some of the immediate bits, and then the rest of the immediate bits are put in the immediate field, right? But they're also numbered very strangely because bit 11 of the immediate is down in this group, right? So it's really convoluted. So in order to make this easy for you, I just give you the code <laughs> in Verilog that, that, that calculates the branch offset. So you can assign branch offset EX as instruction EX bit 31, instruction EX bit 7, instruction EX 30 down to 25, and instruction EX11 down to 8, and then a 0 because this last 0 is the multiplying, oh, this is multiplying by 2, right? So this is actually forming a byte address, okay? And then in the next line of code, I kill those last two bits, right, and convert it back to a word address here. And I might say, well, why do you add a bit only to delete it later? Well, the, the hardware will optimize that out anyway. But the reason I do it is because if you look at the instruction set architecture for RISC V, <coughs> this is how this is right from the instruction set architecture, right? So I, I wanted to copy it basically verbatim to make sure I was doing it right. <laughs> so if you look at the ISA, this is how they tell you to do it, and then this next line of code is where we take the PCEX. Notice it's EX, and I add the branch offset. Um, I add the branch offset taking off the last two bits and then duplicating bit 12 because that's the sign extend, right? So I have to sign extend it and divide it by 4, okay? Because again, there's a byte address because the documentation has it in terms of byte address and then I divide by 4 and sign extend and add to the program counter, right? So this is all the logic you need actually to calculate the target address for a branch. Yes? Bits, 
Yeah, so the PC, um, hopefully I did this right. So this is 12 down to 2, right? This 11 bits, and this makes it 12 bits, right? So this is, I'm only having to sign extend by 1 because if you take all the bits that you get from the instruction, you end up with uh, 11 effective bits. Oh, but we don't, the, the offset is only... So the program counter is 12 bits, right? That's our program because we have a 4,096 oh, entry program. memory, right? But it's a word memory. It's a word address memory. Oh. So we have a 4,000 instruction capacity. And so it's a 12-bit 12 12-bit 12 uh, address to our instruction RAM. And then I basically adjust this to be 12 bits, and then I add, okay, yeah. right? So by the way, what I said about range doesn't really apply to us because we only have a 12-bit, but normally range is a, a, obviously a concern, but because our instruction RAM is so small, we can cover half the range. We, we, we have half the range of our instructions. Yeah, I forgot our PC is not 32 bits. Yep. Yeah, exactly, because our PC isn't 32 bits. Okay, so now we have the jump instruction. This one is another strange one. This, um, this is, uses a 20-bit immediate. So you might say, oh, 20-bit immediate. That means it's a U-type instruction, right? No, it's a J-type. <laughs> I think J-type and U-type are different, even though they're very similar. So there's, a, I believe, a 20-bit immediate plus an RD field and an opcode. Now, you might remember that MIPS had a J-type also, but the J-type in MIPS was a 26-bit address. But in Risk Five, they shrank it to 20, I guess it's 21 bits, that must be, or no, no, it is still 20 bits. It's 20 bits because the opcode is seven bits, right? I think, yeah, opcode is seven bits in Risk Five, six bits in MIPS, I always get, I always forget that. So I think there's a seven bit, five bit, 20 bit, right? Uh, so there's 12 bits up here and 20 bits left over for the immediate. So why not, why not use a 26 bit offset like, MIPS does, because RISC doesn't have a pure jump instruction. If you do a jump instruction, it actually becomes a jump and link instruction using register X0 as the link address. Right, remember MIPS had a jump and a jump and link. If you did a jump and limp link in MIPS, it would always link to register 31. You couldn't change it. But in RISC, RISC V, they decided that you should be able to control what the link address is the link register is. You guys remember how the link works? So link is the re so the idea with link is that link is it takes the program counter and it puts the program counter in the register, so whoever you're jumping to can get back, right? So it's for function calls, like or method calls, right? You call a method you want to return. the The link uh, register is the return address, and you've got the program counter is already the next instruction, so it's a convenient it's a convenient place to link, right? Make sense? Now, you guys might be thinking, wait a second, hold on, that would require that I take the program counter and put it in the register file, but we don't have a way to do that right now. There's no way to get the program counter in the register file. Right, yeah, well, you have a mux, you have one empty slot on your mux, remember? Remember we had a three to one mux on the register file for reg, Red cell, the red cell mux, right? So you can use that extra slot for the program counter. Okay. Okay, so what about the encoding? Well, the encoding is even weirder here. <laughs> it's like instruction, it's immediate bit 20, and then immediate bit 10 down to 1, and then immediate bit 11, and then immediate bit 19 to 20. They scramble these. Almost, it almost seems like they scramble them like randomly. <laughs> I don't know why they do that. So, so I went ahead and gave you the code to interpret this. So I have something called JAL offset EX, and I have this line of code that will take the bits from the instruction and will basically r r unscramble them to create a signal, co a coherent offset called JAL offset. Okay, and then of course you would add that JAL offset to your program counter. Now you might say, wait, whoa, 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 MIPS, you didn't add it. No, the J-type, you didn't add that. That was a pseudo direct address. You didn't add it to the program counter. That's correct, but you do in RISC-V. So in RISC-V, the jump 
is still PC relative, but it's just more bits. The offset is more bits, right? It's 20 bit offset. So I created these two tables that translate instruction EX bits to offset bits. Um, um, I don't remember why I have to. I thought it was one. Uh, so 31 goes to 20, 20. I forget how I did this. But anyway, the code is here. So th that's the offset, and that's the. Um, that's the offset, and then the actual address is after you add to the program counter and strip off the last two bits. So once again, the JAL is a 16-bit address. It's pointing to 16-bit chunks. So I had to add a bit here, and I deleted two bits here. You guys see that? Okay. Okay, and then there's a jump register instruction. It's actually jump and link register. So all the jumps link in, uh, in risk, unless you don't want to link and you just use register zero. So jump and link is a I type instruction. It also has an immediate, um, but this one will allow you to specify a register as the target as well as an immediate. Now this one is, this, there's nothing like this in MIPS. MIPS, MIPS doesn't have a, MIPS had a jump and link register, but that was just, that would just take you to the contents of a register. It didn't allow you to modify it with an immediate. This has an immediate. So this one, you take the contents of RS1, um, which is in this case read data 1 EX is what I called it. And then you add the offset calculated from the immediate field, and this one's just a straight up offset. And then, and then, um, yeah, you, actually that's it. You take the register contents and you add the offset. This whole thing here is for sign extending. Make sense? So a, a, a jump and link register allows you to go to an address that's in a register and it allows you to add an offset, and it links back, so the program counter gets linked. So it gives you a return, the ability to return to where you, call, where you went. Now what are you linking, by the way? You're linking PC fetch, not PCEX, because if you link, you don't want to link PCEX, because if you use that as your link, and then you go, you return from your function, you're going to go and just, you're going to just endlessly jump to the function, you'll end up with an infinite loop. You have to make sure that the link address is the instruction that was after the jump, the jump and link. You guys with me? You want to return one slot ahead of where the jump was. Okay. Okay, so, so if everyone's comfortable with that, there's one last, one last issue that we have to cover for jumps and branches. And the problem is, is that branches and jumps have a, ha have a, stall that follow them, always, at least one stall. And deeply pipeline processors like, you know, like real processors within desktops and servers and phones, they have more than one stall because they have deeper pipelines. But even in our three-stage pipeline, we have to stall. You might say, well, why? I mean, just it's a simple, simple processor. The reason is, is because by the time your processor interprets the branch or jump and does all the calculations necessary to figure out where the target is, it's too late. You've already fetched the next instruction. Because remember, you're fetching in parallel with executing. So you're executing the branch, which means figuring out if you should take the branch and calculating the target address while you're fetching the fall through instruction, which is the instruction after that follows the branch or jump, okay? So if it's a branch and if the branch is taken or if it's a jump, you're gonna have to strike whatever instruction had been fetched at the same time. So you're gonna replace the instruction that was fetched with a, with, with a no-op, right? So, so the instruction has to dynamically insert 
a no-op instruction at runtime after every taken branch and after every jump. It has to slip in a no-op. Okay? Does that make sense? So uh, if you look at a timeline here, so like let's say we have an add, an add, and then a branch that's taken. That's what that T stands for. So the problem is here, the fall through is whatever's after the branch in the program. So while we're executing that branch, we're already fetching the next instruction. So that fall through instruction, which is converted to a stall, will become a stall in the next cycle. So in cycle three, I'm fetching the fall through while I'm executing the branch. Cycle four, I say that right? Cycle three, I'm fetching the fall through. In cycle four, I'm executing the fall through, which has now been converted to a stall, or a, a, um, a um, no op. Yes, thank you. Make sense? You guys with me? So how do we how do we do that? Okay, so we've handled this different ways. We've tried different ways to do this in this class over the years. The easiest way we found to do this is don't actually convert the instruction to a stall. Because that's hard. You know, like, it's really hard because remember the instruction memory is a synchronous RAM. So you can't change the behavior of a synchronous RAM. Like, th that instruction is going to come out the next cycle. You can't stop it. If you try to mux it, inside the cycle where it's going through the RAM, then you lose your synchro it has to become an asynchronous RAM. Right? You can't put a RAM inside of a, you can't put a MUX inside of a synchronous RAM. Right? If I read an instruction, I'm going to get it the next cycle, and there's just no way to stop it. It's going to come out. So the easiest way to handle this is to basically tell your control unit to ignore it you can use a single bit flag called stall, stall ex, and in your control unit, you can just have an if statement at the very top of your control unit that says if stall ex is asserted, then yeah, just put, you know, put all zeros out. Treat it like a, a no op. Or treat it like an add. Well, actually, you have to treat it like a no op specifically because you can't rely on there being a zero in the destination register field. So you have to make sure that reg write is zero. You guys with me? Right. But here's the problem though. This can be this can be tricky. This is where some a lot of groups run into a combinatorial uh, loop because the control unit is going to see the branch and it's going to say, oh I got a stall. So then it's going to say stall and then it's going to say, oh, I'm supposed to be stalling. Oh, okay, then it's not a branch, so don't stall anymore. So then the branch comes out and says, oh, wait, it's a branch. i got to stall. And then it stalls, and it says, oh, I'm stalling. This isn't a branch. I don't need to stall. And then it turns off stall. And it goes around and around and around infinitely, and model sim locks up. Right? You end up with a, um, basically an oscillator, a ring oscillator. Okay, but that's assuming that you don't put a delay between the output stall and the input stall, right? So what you have to do is stick a register. So the, the, the control unit is going to have two stalls. There'll be an output stall that'll be called stall fetch. That means stall the instruction in fetch. Then there's an input called stall ex, which means I'm stalling the instruction in execute. And the difference between those, it's going to be a feedback, but there's a register in there that will guarantee that if the control unit says stall well, who's in fetch, the impact of that isn't felt until the next cycle, not the current cycle. If you don't put that register in there, you end up with a combinatorial loop, which will cause model sim not to um, converge on a simulation solution, right? Okay, so you have to be careful about that because if that happens, if you get a combinatorial loop, the simulator will, f will, will, will hang, and it'll make it impo it, it's impossible to find out where the loop is. The only way to discover it is to you know, randomly delete lines of code and try again. That's literally, you have to use trial and error. There's no way to detect, no way I've found anyway, to detect a combinatorial loop um, in simulation.
Okay, so you have to be careful there. So basically, like I said, put a, put a register here. Now it's a little, that register is a pipeline register which will convey, it'll delay the output, stall output before it becomes the input. It'll delay it by one, one clock cycle, right? So that way you shouldn't run into that, that problem. Okay, um, the PCEX, by the way, I've already talked about this, but the program counter, that needs also a register to delay that one cycle. And the addresses that I gave you the code for, there's three of them because now we have, th and, and again, this is, this is more complex than MIPS, but I've covered three separate ways to calculate a branch or target, branch or uh, jump target, right? I've called them branch address EX, JAL address EX, and JALR address EX. Um, you can call them whatever you want, but those are the three different addressing mechanisms that we've covered for branch and jumps. All three of those are going to go inside of your PC source MUX. You might say, we don't have a PC source MUX. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you have to add the PC source MUX. So you have to add a MUX. Right now, your program counter is just the only value it gets every cycle is PC plus one. It's just a counter. But if you put a MUX in there, you can control what the program counter fetch gets in the next cycle. And that'll be controlled by MUX, which will be then controlled by another output of your control unit called PC source EX. So PC source EX will be set uh, whenever you have uh, a branch or a, a, a taken branch or a jump. Now, if you have a branch that's not taken, then you don't have to stall and you don't have to change PC source. It's only for taken branches, right? Which means that you have to resolve the branch in the ALU. Now, how do you do that? Well, remember, um, there's a zero output from your ALU you can use, and there's also a set less than operation on your ALU you can use to resolve branches. Uh, let me see, the next slide I think shows that. Yeah, so, okay, so here's a couple things here. You've got, um, oh, right, one thing. I want to correct myself here, one thing here. So I mentioned that when you link, I always forget about this. This is a detail, important detail. When you link, the link address is PC fetch. I mentioned that, right? You want to link, you want to take the address of the instruction after the jump, and that's what you're going to link. That's your return address, right? Right? But that's from the perspective of the execute stage, right? The problem is, is that remember, when you actually link, you have to write the register in the write back stage, which is in the next cycle. So the signal that you actually put into that MUX is actually not PC fetch, it's PCEX, because you have to delay the PC fetch by one cycle before you can write it back, right? So that's why I show PCEX here instead of PC fetch. You are writing back the PC fetch, but you have to delay it. And you've already got a built-in delay for that called PCEX that we're adding for this lab, right? Is it, so I know that's kind of confusing, but PCEX refers to the program counter of the instruction that's in the execute. What instruction is that? Well, it's going to be a stall. When you, that instruction is going to be a stall, but its program counter is going to be the program counter of the instruction that would have come after the jump, which is now where it's being interpreted as a stall, but that will also be our link address. So you actually want to write PCEX back to the, to the register file. Make sense? So it's basically just adding a pipeline register for PC fetch, but we've already done that and called it PCEX, so you can just recycle PCEX. Okay, um, yeah, that's pretty much, I think that's the only change here. Yeah, that's the only new thing that we added. So in the previous slide, um, yeah, I should have highlighted the new stuff in red, but I mean, there wasn't much in the fetch stage before, right? It was pretty much just the program counter and the instruction memory. Now we've got the program counter in this MUX, the program counter MUX and the stall signal. Okay, so I tried to enumerate here everything you have to add um, for the lab, going from lab three to lab four. Add the branch address, JAL address, and JALR address as possible next state values for the PC. So you can just copy and paste that. I think, as far as I know, the code is correct. 
for those. We've been using that now for, this is our third, third year with that. I, I haven't, no one's found any problems with that. The PC source EX is another output to your program, your, uh, is your control unit. Now you might say, oh God, you mean I have to add PC source to every single if then else block? No, no, just set a default of zero at the beginning and then just set it to one, two, or three at the appropriate spots in your control unit, which is just for the branch and jumps, right? Um, um, stall fetch is an output. I mentioned that's just going to be one whenever you have a taken branch or a jump, so that's pretty simple to add, right? That's just it's pretty much any time you, you're changing your control, you have to set that. Uh, stall ex is going to be an input, which is the delayed form of stall fetch, and add uh, program counter ex is a possible input to reg write. No, that's not right. Um, reg dest mux, I should say there, right? Dest mux. There we go. Uh, and then in the control unit, if stall ex is asserted, don't write the registers or the program counter. Um, that's also wrong. You always write the program counter. You can't control that. <laughs> I don't know why I put that in there. You have to write the pro program counter gets updated every cycle. There's not, nothing you can do about it. It's always going to be rolling, right? Um, Now, if you don't want to change the program counter, you could, um, you, could, you could have an instruction that loops to itself, but even if you do that, it's going to change because it's going to, it's going to be, like for example, if instruction 10 is jumping back to instruction 10, you're going to actually see 10, 11, 10, 11, 10, 11, 10, 11, because that 11, it'll go to 11 on the stall and then back to 10, and then 11 on the stall and back to 10. So there's no way, you can't keep, there's no possible way to keep the, con the program the program counter constant. At the very least, it'll oscillate between two values. That's about the most you can. That's that's the only way you can stop the, the thing from running. Um, and then, for branch resolution, and I'm I, I I'm usually, oh yeah, here we go. Branch resolution. Branch resolution is um, this part is a little tricky because. Um, the branch resolution can be handled outside the main control unit or inside the main control unit. We've tried it both ways in this class, and again, we've, we've, we've found, we've kind of converged on the, this way that I'm going to suggest you do it because of, it seems like it's the easiest way in our experience. We generally do this in the control unit. So the control unit, you'll have an if statement that'll say if it's a branch, if it's a branch of equal, and then embedded inside that if, you can have a nested if statement that handles the resolution, right? So you'll say if this is a branch of equal, then if the zero output from the ALU is true, then take the branch. Otherwise, don't take the branch. What do you mean by take the branch? Well, set PC source install. Otherwise, don't. Right? PC source install together will determine whether you set, whether you, you take, it, that determines whether the branch is taken. Right? PC source install. PC source because you have to go to some other than next PC. Install stalls. You know, I'd say, well, can't you combine those into one signal somehow? Yeah, probably. But we usually just keep them as separate. A little redundant, but okay. Okay, so how do you resolve branches? There's uh, six branch instructions. Um, yeah, but um, let's see. We have so this is actually pretty. I think pretty straightforward because. You can resolve all of these branch instructions either by using the subtract or the set less than operator on the, on the ALU. You might say like, well, why, w under what circumstances would that not be the case? Well, I can tell you, um, you have branch less than and you have branch greater than or equal to. Why those two? Because they're opposites. 
if I said that you have to do branch of greater than, now you've got a problem. Because branch of, you don't have a way to do greater than. There's no way to do that. But we don't have that, so you don't have to worry about it. Everything we're doing here with the branches can be done with the equals, which is the zero, subtract operator. E equality is tested with subtract. And less than is tested with um, Um, less than is tested with set less than. Greater than or equal is also tested with set less than. It's just complemented. Right? You look for the R being 0 instead of 1. Because right? remember, set less than, when you do set less than on the ALU, it just gives you a 0 or a 1. Right? If, if, you, if you apply negative logic to that you know, and you say set less than, then it would tell, be telling you if the first A was greater than or equal to B. Right? Make sense? Okay, so um, okay, so here's my other list of things to do for this lab. There's six things. Um, add the code to generate your targets, which which I've got in the slides. Add the PC mux. Add stall fetch as an output of the control unit. Add the decoding maps for J and B type instruction. Um, Decoding map, decoding entries in the control unit. I should say add control unit code for J and B type instructions. Add the PC EX into the reg cell mux, which I mentioned earlier, and add entries to the control unit. At, oh, uh, that's redundant. Okay, I don't I guess we don't need that for. I don't know why it seems redundant. Okay. So there's five things, right? You have the, th the three targets, the PC MUX, the stall fetch, PCEX, and the control unit code. So there's really not a lot, I mean, there's, there's not a lot of extra things you have to add in terms of, you know, lines of code to your, to your existing CPU. Okay, so we have a test program for this, and uh, so you can use this to test, and then once you're done with this, then you're just going to use your, uh, you're going to do your square root program. You can run your square root program from lab one. Um, so the test program here is uh, kind of a gauntlet of uh, jumps and branches and links. Um, so I'm, it's like, yeah, basically it's like an obstacle course, but I have the fetch sequence here for you. Now the confusing part about this though is that <clears throat> this fetch sequence is looking at PC fetch. So you're going to fetch 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm oh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, rather. Let's stop at 3, because 3 is the first branch that's taken, right? After 3, you're going to go to target 3. Where's target 3? Down here, 8, right? You're supposed to go from 3 to 8, right? But there's a stall. So what you're actually going to see is 4. 4 will be fetched, but it's a stall. So every one of these branches and jumps, if you translate it the way they go in the code, you always have to add an extra cycle to each for the fetch stall. And, and the reason I mention this is because the way that you debug these is by looking at the program counter sequence, right? It's all about the sequence of instructions, the well, sequence of addresses, rather. So that's how you test. Remember, we were talking about how do, you, how do we test the old lab? Well, you look at the registers. Well, how do you test this lab? You look at the program counter sequence, the, the order of program counter values. That's how you test branches and jumps, because it's all about how you, how you walk through the code. Okay, and then um, and the, the, the uh, TAs will talk about this more, uh, but the second program for this one is we want to be able to put a number in the DE2 board. I, I talked about this at the beginning of the semester. You want to put an integer into the switches, have it calculate the square root, and then bring back the square root in base 10. Right? So this will be an actual calculator, essentially, where you put a number in an integer between 0 and uh, 262,000, whatever, right? And it'll calculate the square root and print the square root on the hex displays, but you want to print them as a three 
digits dot five digits. So as a fixed point decimal. And I say, wait a minute, wait, how do you do fixed point decimal? We've done fixed point binary this whole time. It's easy. You just multiply, you, you, you calculate your, your square root, which will already be in uh, fixed point, 14 bits, and you multiply that by 100,000. Right, you multi so you have an answer, you'll get an answer like square root of two, it's 1.41 you know, whatever, and then you multiply that by 100,000, and then you knock off the fractional bits and you convert it to base 10 and you stick it on the hex displays. That's all, that's all you gotta do. Now it's a little tricky though because it's another case of when you multiply by 100,000 you're gonna get an overflow unless you use all 64 bits of the product of the multiply, right? So you have to use the mol h thing again, the mol h u and the mol h, you'll have to do a little bit manipulation, but basically that's what you do is you take the, the fractional 14 bit fractional number multiply it by 100,000, put the answer out, and you'll get the square root. Now this lab is really cool if you get it working because you can actually put in two, you can have a calculate the square root of two, <clears throat> you know, this, um, and it'll actually, now remember though that in lab two, uh, sorry, lab one, you were putting in a fractional number in the RARs, now it's just going to be an integer, so when you bring the, the switch values in, you're going to have to you're gonna to have to shift those by 14 bits to the left to basically pad that out with dot zero, 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 right? You guys with me? You didn't do that with lab one, right? Lab one, you, you, your input was already a fixed point. In this lab, your input is an integer value from the switches. You'll have to add the zero fractional bits to it. Just a 14-bit shift, right? So keep that in mind. And then you run through your, your existing square root code and then you multiply the answer by 100,000 and then you run through your existing base, t uh, base 10 conversion code that you wrote for the last lab. So you get to reuse the code that you wrote in the last lab and the code you wrote in lab one. Now you get to put them both together. You get to re, we, we come full circle, you, you bring all the code that you wrote so far into one project. Okay? Uh, and you should have all the instructions you need to implement your lab one code. Now we didn't give you any restrictions on what instructions to use in lab one, so you might have used an instruction in lab one that you're not going to have in your repertoire and your hardware, but I don't think so. I don't think, I don't remember that ever happening before. I think you should be fine. If you look at your instructions for lab one, every one of those instructions should be valid, should be, should be part of your, your subset of risk five instructions for your hardware, I hope. If not, you may have to tweak your code a little bit for lab one, but I should be okay. Okay, I'm out of time. I'm actually going over. Sorry about that. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you in lab.